All right. Hello and welcome everyone to the Byzantine Scotist. Um, yeah, so I just thought, you know, I had some extra time today and um, sometime in the next week or so, actually, my uh, second child will be born. So I probably won't have much free time for a few months to do any YouTube streams. So I thought, why not do a YouTube stream? And I'm currently in the middle of sort of lots of new research projects. So I felt like there was no one thing that I could like get everything together for today to present something. Um, it was Reformation Day, so I thought maybe I could do something uh, responding to Protestantism, but I was like, I don't have anything together right now. Uh, so I thought what I'd do instead is just talk about some of the steps I go through with researching SCOTUS and recommending resources on SCOTUS to other people. Because uh, I get this question a lot, and I will try after this stream to put together all the different resources that I talk about in this stream so that um, they'll all be together and you can go reference them. There's just actually one more work I thought of now that I'm going to pull up before we get into this. Again, people post in the chat to make sure uh, they can hear everything that I'm saying fine. Here we go. Let me pull up this work as well. And then after, also please post questions you have in the chat. And then um, afterwards, I'll go through all the questions. And um, no to them. All right. So let me pull up the first resource I have here. So I'm going to first start with very introductory works in English. And I'm really going to do two sections here. I'm going to do a section on resources in English, and then I'm going to do a section on resources in Latin. Because if you can read Latin, and the Latin works I'm going to be recommending, except for the very last one, are very, very simple Latin. If you have a few years of Latin, you'll have no trouble with these. You can look up words you don't recognize. Um, and so if you can access the Latin works we're going to be talking about later, those are miles above anything that's available in English. And even I think a lot of the best English SCOTUS scholars will fully say, yeah, the old stuff from the 17, 16 and 1700s is just better. They're not made like uh, they were back then. There's a great article. Um, I can never remember the name of the author. I will link that below as well on the history of education in the conventual order. And it talks about the development actually of one of the works we'll be talking about here and its context. And it's just amazing the amount of education these people went through back in the day. They would have, um, and this is the conventuals in the 15, 1600s, their curriculum was they would start off with three years of logic. And this is not three years you study logic, you also do some other stuff, you take lots of time off. No, this is year round, six days a week, from when you woke up to when you went to bed, you studied logic and that was it for three years, around starting around the age of 14 or so. Um, then after that, you would have three years of study of philosophy. Uh, you would use the works of Aristotle and use the commentaries of Scotus and other Scotus. Uh, then they would have six years of theology, usually about three years of studying St. Bonaventure and then three years of studying Scotus. And St. Bonaventure always remained an important theological authority along with uh, Scotus. There's often a division made between the two of these nowadays, but there was no division made historically. Um, they always continued to study Bonaventure. Now, he didn't write philosophical commentaries, so it was difficult to use him philosophically. But actually, one of the works we'll be looking at here in the Latin section is a philosophical cursus, according to Bonaventure. And I was going through that last night, and it just agrees with Scotus on everything. You can read it and see. All right, so let's go through here some of the very introductory works I want to recommend. Now, the first one for English is a book that's out of print, but I have a PDF copy of it, and I'll link that below, uh, which is Nothing for Your Journey by Father Ephraim Batoni. Now, there was a movement along with Neotomism in the early 20th century, the Neo-Scotist movement. And I think this is really the best of modern Scotism you'll find in this Neo-Scotist movement. And one of them was Father Ephraim Batoni. 
And he has this very good introductory book really to the whole Franciscan way of doing philosophy and theology. And see here are the chapters we have on voluntarism, uh, supreme good, love, Christ is the center, um, the philosophy of nature we have here, and then also a view of the social order. And in all of these, he starts off with the example of St. Francis and then how St. Bonaventure really developed theology through um, the work here of um, Scotus, rather through the work, through the life of Francis, really developed a theology upon it and that's how Scotus helped systematize it. And this is a very wonderful book and it's very introductory. Um, now, if you're looking for something a bit more philosophical, in introduction, I recommend a very good recent book, which is uh, Ordered by Love by uh, Dr. Thomas Ward. And I actually had Ward on my channel to discuss the book. And this it's mostly focused on Scotus's philosophy, but it gives a very good introduction to his philosophy. It has a very brief um, last chapter discussing some of the main points of his theology. Uh, but you really can't understand Scotus's theology unless you understand his philosophy. So it's important to first be well versed in that philosophy. And this is a great introduction to really some of the major themes in the philosophy of Scotus. All right. Um, here we go. The next one I want to recommend is I think really sort of the best heavy hitting philosophical work in English on Scotism. And this is the transcendentals and their function in the metaphysics of Dun Scotus. Now, you can actually rent this for free through archive.org for an hour at a time. Now, the issue you're probably going to have is I've just given you all the same work. And now I'm sure all of you are going to be going to rush to the borrow link. Um, and so unfortunately, only a certain number of people can check it out at a time. I've never had an issue, but I think that's because a lot of people don't know this exists. Um, this is a really wonderful book on the transcendentals in Scotus. And now you might be saying, all right, the transcendentals, they don't seem that important of a thing. And within St. Thomas's account of the transcendentals, since the transcendentals are primarily beings of reason, they don't play a very important role. I, mean, I don't want to say a very important, but they don't play as important of a role. But for Scotus, he has three types of transcendentals, uh, really four types as... Um, Walter lays it out, where there's first just transcendental being in general. You have the uh, concept of being, which is transcendental. Then you have those things which are convertible with being, which is unity, truth, and goodness. But then you also have the disjunctive transcendentals. So all being can be in one of two modes. And this is where you get a lot of things that are very central to metaphysics, but aren't really included in, say, a Thomist uh, treatment as transcendental. You know, they still include all these things. They wouldn't call them transcendentals. And so for Scotus, then, the transcendentals are the center of his philosophy. And this is where you get things like act and potency, or necessary and contingent, or substance and accident, or infinite or finite, and so on and so forth. And then finally, you have the last section on the pure perfections, which Scotus calls transcendentals, but were often included by a lot of later Scotists, not in their philosophy treatises, but in their theology treatises on the nature of God. Um, but here, Walter includes it as another form of transcendental that's included within philosophy. And I don't agree with Walter on everything, um, but I think that this is a very good introduction, and really the best introduction you're going to find in English to the central element of Scotus's philosophy. All right. Then, um, here we go. Another uh, important work on his philosophy is his work, A Treatise on God as First Principle, the uh, De Primo Principio, which is Scotus's proof for the existence of God. Um, and it also works in a lot of his metaphysics as well. So this will pair very well with Walter's work. Um, and it'll also get you some basics of Scotus's view of uh, the nature of God as well. Now, there's an older translation actually by Alan Walter, 
And I think that's the one that's up here on EWTN for free. Uh, but Thomas Ward is currently working actually on a new translation of it uh, with a commentary on it. So I'm very much looking forward to that. And I asked him when that should be out. And he said sometime early 2024. And I'll sure I'll, I'll have uh, Ward back on to talk about it. All right. Um, here we go. From here, maybe we can move on a bit to um, more theological topics in SCOTUS. Now, first, I actually want to recommend a work of St. Bonaventure. And that's St. Bonaventure's Disputed Questions on the Mystery of the Trinity. Now, this was actually a work that it's sort of shocking that SCOTUS follows in his treatment of God this work very closely. And actually, this even has the disjunct of transcendentals in it. Here we go. You pull up where it is in here. Yeah, and it's arguments for the existence of God, which he starts off with. Um, here we go. He says, there, uh, if there is posterior being, then there is prior being. And he says, if there is being that exists from another, there is being that does not exist from another. Then he goes on, if there is possible being, there is necessary being. Here we go. If there is relative being, there is absolute being. If there is diminished being or qualified being, then there is being absolutely. If there is being that exists because of another, that is being that exists because of itself. Again, if there is being in potency, there is being an act. So he lists off uh, quite a number of Scotus's disjunctive transcendentals at the beginning of this work. And his Trinitarian theology and his uh, view of God as one very closely follows Scotus. One example I've found of this, because I've just been reviewing this work recently, because I'm actually, for this work, I'm going to be writing on this for the Creation Theology Fellowship, and my reflections on this for the Creation Theology Fellowship. That's uh, creationtheologyfellowship.org or at CT Fellowship on Twitter. Uh, starting on, I think, November 5th. So next week, we're going to be releasing reflections on this work. So, um, yeah, highly recommend everyone go subscribe to our email list at the Creation Theology Fellowship, and I'll be talking about this work. But in, um, what is it? Question seven. He discusses um, the relationship between necessity and freedom in God. And he actually uses uh, Scotus's, the same view of Scotus as the pure perfections that all being, rather that uh, God has all perfections and necessity and will are both perfections. Therefore, God must have both to an infinite degree. Uh, so this is really a great work and it's very, it's Bonaventure, but you'll see a lot of Scotus in this. And uh, now, the reason I say it's sort of strange that Scotus has all this is that this work was lost very early on. The latest citation we have it is in Peter of John Olivi, uh, who was before Scotus. So I suspect either Scotus had this work or he, he definitely studied under people who had read it. Uh, but unfortunately, it was lost very early on and rediscovered in the 19th century. But a very, very important work there. And then if you'd like help understanding that book, I highly recommend this study, Caritas in Primo by Jared Goff. Um, and also has an interesting forward by Father Christian Capes, who talks um, about some of the connections of this and the Eastern Christian tradition. And then as well as an afterward by Father Peter Damian Fellner, who was probably the greatest scholar of SCOTUS in the 20th and early 21st century. Uh, talking about how this connects actually with SCOTUS quite a bit. But Jared Goff goes through and basically gives the whole context of the De Mysterio, talks about Bonaventure's reception of Aristotle in the De Mysterio, and then goes through all the articles in it. So I highly recommend this book, Caritas and Primo, uh, a very good commentary to have alongside uh, on the mystery of the Trinity by Bonaventure. All right, then going back to stuff on SCOTUS. Here we go. A great uh, work to start off with, sort of the key point of Scotus's theology, is the primacy of Christ. And Father Maximilian Mary Dean uh, wrote a very good short introduction to the theology of the absolute primacy in Scotus. Uh, but you can actually find all the resources on this on his website. He put the whole book online for free, as well as turned it into a video series you can find on YouTube. If you go to absoluteprimacyofchrist.org, he has all the articles and then if you search, you can find a whole bunch of other sorts of um, 
stuff that he has um, written on, on the absolute primacy. And it's a great starting point. And one of the most helpful things actually is this section on Scotus's writings, where he goes through and gives you a little bit of context about um, what Scotus actually himself wrote on the absolute primacy, because that does clarify quite a bit. All right. And then, oh, there we go. Father Maximilian is in the chat right now. Welcome, Father Maximilian. And then one other resource I'd like to recommend, I think this is one of the last secondary sources we'll be looking at in English, is the Mariology of Blessed John Duns Scotus by Father Ruggero Rosini. And actually the English edition was translated by Father Peter Damian Fellner and actually has an afterwards written by him adding some additional notes, including actually a comprehensive discussion in one of the appendixes on, um, what was the issue? The Debitum Picati and arguing for an anti debitist position based on the principles of SCOTUS. And I know that was an internet controversy that went around a few months ago. A very detailed discussion of Mariology in SCOTUS. And it's not just the absolute primacy, but the whole of his Mariology and closely connecting it to his view of the absolute primacy so that you can see really the internal unity of it and how SCOTUS got to the Immaculate Conception because it's not just Scotus got lucky and landed on it versus other people did it, but it's rather Scotus's Christology, that natural, and theology just in, in philosophy in general, that naturally leads him to the conclusion of the Immaculate Conception, as well as the Fifth Marian Dogma of the Co-Redemptrix, um, Mediatrix of All Graces, and um, Advocate. All right. And then finally... Um, one last resource here I want to recommend, and this is one of the greatest services that's been given to us, really, is the work of Dr. Peter Simpson. Now, he's a retired classics professor, but if you go to his website, uh, Aristotleophile, there we go, and I'll link it below, of course, like everything else, uh, he has here in his current work section, translated the entire thing, uh, thousands of pages, and put it all up on the internet for free. And this is really one of the greatest works that's ever been done in English Scotism. And also lots of other great things. We translated parts of Jerome of Montefiore's uh, Scotus Summa, where Jerome of Montefiore went and rearranged the texts of Scotus to follow the order of the Summa. And so that, here if we open one of these, is it sharing this instead? Let's see. How do I pull up this? Here we go. Share this tab instead. There we go. Um, you can see here it will list the positions of St. Thomas and Scotus side by side. So you can see the similar sorts of objections and their different opinions on matters. And this is really a great service. Here, if I go back to that work, there's also other great works of Scotism on here. So here we go. We have William de Lamara, who a student of um, St. Bonaventure, who wrote a correction to St. Thomas, according to Franciscan principles. Um, we, have, we have Antonius Andreas, who was probably the most important uh, student of Scotus in transmitting Scotism and some translations to some of his works, as well as probably the other most important student of Scotus is uh, Francis Mayronis. And we have Hero Treatise on one of his works, which is on the University of Being. And see, so, yeah, there's a lot of really other great stuff here as well. So I highly recommend the work of uh, Peter Simpson, who really has made SCOTUS accessible to people who don't know Latin. And there's other collections of SCOTUS's works as well, because this will limit it a bit. Maybe actually one other set of works I want to recommend while I'm thinking of it here. So some quite good introductions. Here we go. Here we go. There's two works here I'll pull up. Um, here we go. First one is The Philosophy of John Dun Scotus by Antony Vos. And it's quite good, actually, this introduction. Uh, then he also has another one, here we go, which is The Theology of John Dun Scotus, which is also quite good. Um, and it's sort of shocking that his theology one is very good because he's actually a Protestant. And you'll notice this in his outline because the big topic missing in his discussion of theology is Mariology. 
uh, there's no discussion of Mariology within it. And I actually don't remember if he even discusses the absolute primacy. So he's clearly missing a very key point. But a lot of his other discussions are very good here, including his discussion of the sacraments. I've read through the whole uh, chapter on the sacraments, and he does a very good job of actually explaining correctly Scotus's views, even though he disagrees with them on that. So yeah, I'd highly recommend uh, Vos's book as a good introduction, as well as two books. All right, now we're going to go on to the second section on works in Latin. If you can read Latin and you're able to access these works in Latin, you will be miles ahead of everything you will be able to access in the English sections I'm talking about here. All right, so let's see. Let's start off with Du Pasquier. So here we go. I actually want to first, let me see if this website's working. Here we go. I first want to just recommend a website that's a great resource for all of this sorts of stuff in Latin which is the Post-Reformation Digital Library. And it has lots of stuff before SCOTUS. And you can put in all sorts of authors here. So we're about to check out Sebastian Dupasquier. So let's look up Dupasquier. And here we go. Here are all the works of Dupasquier, and some of them in multiple different copies. Now, some people have gone through, some scholars, and they have scanned basically um, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of pages of these works of scholastics into Google Books. And they're all in the public domain. So if you can read Latin, you can read basically one of the largest, with probably the largest library on theology ever for free if you just go to Google Books. You know, it's very rare I don't find a work. Like I, I'm trying to find um, Matthew Ferchi's work on the angels. But unfortunately, that one's not on Google Books. But you have to go pretty obscure like that in order to find a work that's not on Google Books. All right. Um, now let's go to Dupasquier, since I just mentioned him. Here we go. So Sebastian Dupasquier is... Uh, he's one of the few SCOTUS actually in the 18th century. Most of the major SCOTUS are in the 17th century. But in the 18th century, he's able to take and summarize a lot of the earlier works from the, uh, six, from the 17th century. Here we go. And this is, I just pulled up his first volume. So he has four volumes on philosophy, uh, logic, metaphysics, uh, physics, and then sort of a miscellaneous on other stuff. Uh, and these are quite good discussions of philosophy and really, I think, does a great job summarizing um, really, well, really who he's summarizing here is um, Bartholomew Mastrius and uh, Bonaventure Belluto. And they together created a um, long and detailed cursus or a course, really, who translated on uh, philosophy. Introduction of Scotist philosophy. Was, as I mentioned at the beginning of this stream, they were studying Aristotle and using, using Scotist commentaries. But starting especially with Suarez, the style of education in the Catholic world was shifting instead to manuals that instead of directly commenting upon the text of Aristotle, you would summarize them. And so that's essentially what Dupasquier is doing. Now you can go read Masterius. You can find all of Masterius's works um, for free on Google Books as well. The issue is there's around probably five to ten times the amount of text you'll have to read. And that's because a lot of what Masterius is dealing with is contemporary debates in his day. He'll especially spend a lot of time debating with another famous Scotist from that time, uh, John Punch. And so if you're not that interested in sort of intra-Scotist debates, which I assume most people watching this are not at that level yet, uh, I wouldn't worry too much about that. I mean, I haven't even read Masterist directly myself. I've just read him summarized by other people like Dupasquier. All right. Now, another interesting um, set of philosophy manuals I want to recommend. Here we go. Are not actually a Scotist one, but I think a really interesting one to compare to the Scotist one, which is, this is the one I just discovered last night, really, is um, Bartolomeus de Barberis, who wrote in the 17th century a philosophical cursus according to St. Bonaventure. And he's, this is basically the only philosophical cursus ever written according to the mind of St. Bonaventure. 
But what you'll find is he's actually extremely close to SCOTUS, and he's very aware of this. Um, Tay Barberis is very engaged with um, Mastrius' treatment quite a lot. He refers to him by his other title, uh, De Medulla. But you'll see him cite Medulla all over the uh, place here, often in agreements. Every once in a while, he'll disagree. But these are quite interesting. And he even does things like I was looking at his discussion of the properties of being. And when he's discussing the prop, how we predicate of being, he says it's univocal in the mind, univocal in concept, but analogical in reality, which is, and he notes that that's the position of Mastrius on Scotus as well, even if some Scotus held that it was univocal in the reality as well. And it's also the view of most modern Scotus scholars as well. Now, one thing interestingly you'll note is when he does discuss metaphysics in part three, at the very end of part three, really, uh, he gives the convertible properties of being of one good and true, but not the disjunctive properties. And that's because he lacked the questions on the Trinity. So he didn't know Bonaventure actually taught the disjunctive transcendentals. And so actually you're getting an important part of Bonaventure that was lost to history uh, if you add on Du Pasquier. And I, what I would like to do in a project I want to work on is reading basically um, Du Pasquier, maybe finding another Scotist more in the tradition of John Punch and Barbary East, and actually read all of their um, different philosophy curses side by side and compare their various opinions on matter. Another similarity I found is with exemplary cause. Both, um, who is it? Um, du Pasquier and De Barberis agree that. Um, Exemplary cause is a kind of uh, moral or intentional causality, and therefore, while it can't really be reduced to any of the four causes, if it has to be, it really reduces to efficient cause. I think that's quite interesting as well. All right. Um, let's see. What else did I want to recommend? Now let's go on to some theology resources here in Latin. So sort of the gold standard of theology manuals in Latin is Cloud Frossen. He wrote a 12-volume uh, series on Scotist theology. You'll know, click on one of them. Let's well, so you click on Tome 1. It actually starts off with about 50 pages on um, refuting every heresy, uh, listing off and sort of short, quickly refuting every heresy in history. Let's pull up Tome 2 so you can just see a little bit of it. Here we go. Yeah, so we have our disputations. Here we go. So on the essential properties of God, uh, uh, operative attributes of God, on the divine intellect and our knowledge of God, on the divine intellect, um, is it, as it is operative power. So even my Latin isn't great. I get, I'm get. i not entirely sure what uh, Quatenius is there. I have to, and that's the thing. When you're reading these works in Latin, if you're not great at Latin, just skip over a word if you're not sure and then come back to it at the end of the sentence once you understand it. And actually a great resource for looking up words is use Wiktionary. Uh, Wiktionary actually has a very good uh, library of um, scholastic Latin, I've found. And Logion is not as good with scholastic Latin. All right. So that is, that's what sort of was considered the gold standard. Uh, he's actually the only other major um, 18th century Scotist I know. And he actually worked for the court of um, the Sun King, Louis XIV. All right, let's see. Where else did I want to pull up? Here we go. Now, in terms of other commentaries, uh, we have Du Pasquier. He actually wrote a uh, commentary on theology. Here, I'll pull this up. You know, when I was looking at it, this is, this is actually quite good. I read through his treatment. Is it in this volume or is it in another volume? This might just be on God as one. Let's see. Yeah, it's not in this volume. I read through his treatment of the six days of creation in another one of the volumes, and it was very good. And his discussion on the six days of creation includes a discussion of how dragons live in the Indian Ocean. So I hope that, that entices you enough to be willing to read these. And if you can't read Latin, I, I, I will say I know of zero modern Scotists who have written discussions of dragons. So if you want to read about the Scotist view of dragons, you got to read Latin. All right. Then I also will mention 
Um, De Barberis also wrote a whole treatment of theology, Ad Mentem Bonaventure. And this is very, very good. I was reading some of it last night. Uh, it's in two volumes, but the Google Books edition actually contains both volumes in the same edition. Uh, very good. I'll probably be doing some stuff on some of uh, Barbarius's works. Uh, he also wrote a whole like commentary on the entire Bible. So I want to take a look at that. I've barely gotten a chance to look at his stuff. Because as I said, I really just found out about him last night. Also, huge shout out in all of this to Dr. Jared Goff for making me aware of like 95% of the resources I've shown here today. In terms of other great theological works, none of them pulled up right now to show. Uh, really, I think the best work on Scotist theology ever is by Angelo Volpez. I highly recommend his works. Now, unfortunately, the issue you're going to encounter with his works is that they were put on the index. Now, no proposition in his works was ever condemned. It just marks as needs correction. And nothing was ever condemned. He's still widely cited after he's on the index. Uh, Mastrius and uh, Barbarius and Dupasque are all widely citing him. He was well known. And the index is no longer in force. So there's no one binding you from reading it and no proposition in him was ever condemned. Uh, but I do put that out there. He was on the index, but he's also one of the greatest SCOTUS commentators ever. And um, Jared Goff and I are trying to track down the work a Dominican wrote against him that got him put on the index to figure out what were they even complaining about in the first place. And I think it's probably that you don't, you'll notice most of the other SCOTUS, when they disagree with St. Thomas, they're very reverential to him. And that's not as much the case in Volpez. So I think it might be a tone thing that he went after St. Thomas pretty harsh on some points. All right, then the last resource in Latin I wanna recommend is this work, uh, catholiclibrary.org, which has huge amounts of work of medieval works in the original Latin. So here you can find all of St. Bonaventure, all of St. Thomas here, but it's easy to find St. Thomas in Latin, but also Scotus in Latin. Now, the issue you're going to encounter with these works is that these are drawn, I think, out of the Vives edition. And the Vives edition is um, not the modern critical edition of SCOTUS. And so there's going to be weaknesses in there. Now, if you search around archive.org, you can find the modern critical editions of SCOTUS. I think most of the volumes are up there. Um, but you also get interesting things when you look here, like this commentary on the metaphysics of Aristotle. Now, this isn't by um Scotus himself even though it's attributed to him but it's by Antonius Andreas who is one of his uh top students and this wasn't a modern discovery I mean you can even see here in the introduction to the Vives edition they're talking about how most people think this is by Andreas um Mastrius in his introduction to his metaphysics talks about how this is probably by Andreas but it's based upon the works of Scotus and Giorgio Pini has gone through and basically shown that what Andreas did is he took the St. Thomas's commentary on the metaphysics and then modified it according to the text of Scotus. So this is still very closely connected to Scotus. And this is how everyone historically studied Scotus metaphysics was by this work. And I've read little bits of it and it's quite good. So I wouldn't say be afraid if it's not actually by Scotus, just be aware of that. Um... You know, there's also this work on grammar, and this was famously, actually, Heidegger did his dissertation on this, but it's actually not by Scotus. All right. And so I think that's all, yeah, it's all the resources I had recommended, so now I'll go into the Q&A. And I hope that that's helpful with giving you a place to start. Now, I want to end this, actually, by giving a major warning, which is that a lot of modern Scotus scholars know absolutely nothing about the tradition of Scotism. And, that's, and this is quite a major issue. Now, I do think this is changing. Actually, I want to give some evidence this is changing. So we have uh, scholars like Dr. Jared Goff, um, Dr. Trent Pomplin, other people like that who are actually very familiar with the tradition. Just recently, the... Here we go. Yeah, the Angelicum Thomistic Institute actually put on a conference on Scotism and Thomism. So one of the questions I see in the chat is on the differences between Scotism and Thomism. And it's really too complex, I think, to boil down into a quick answer. But some of these discussions are really excellent. Uh, I listened to this one 
a few days ago by Dominic Lamontia on the history of Scotism. He's a grad student at Notre Dame who is studying Scotism and is quite excellent. And, you know, I used to be sort of a diehard uh, Bartholomew Mastrius got everything right. And Mastrius says John Punch gets all sorts of stuff wrong. So I just assume that means Punch must get everything wrong. Uh, but Lamontia actually convinced me that um, is it Mastrius is incorrect on the virtual distinction. So that'll be a mistake then that gets passed on to Dupasquier and that um, Punch is better on that point. But this talk Lamontia gave on um, Jesuit nominal, he's a Scotus and Thomas and the challenge of Jesuit nominalism. Excellent, excellent talk. I highly recommend everyone go see this talk. Because essentially what he shows is that the arguments Thomas are using against uh, the Scotus on univocity are taken up by the nominalists such as Suarez and other nominalists to argue against the existence of universals altogether. And so that's a great talk. I very much recommend that. And so I think that shows a positive movement um, within Scotism. But I think things in English Scotism are going to be getting better. But, you know, I was led astray qu for quite a while. So I don't want to name names right now, but I could give you a long list of names that I would not recommend at all who have, I think, led astray. And I'd rather, instead of critiquing other people's work, I just want to give you a positive portrayal of here's good resources to have. All right. See, on the main differences between Thomism and Scotism, I really think it's sort of too complex to boil down to a very quick answer like that. And so, um, yeah, I'm trying to think if I could sort of, anything I sort of say, I feel like I'm putting an emphasis in sort of one area rather than another or something. So I, I don't want to list off just briefly a few points of difference, but I think that instead I want to give a positive portrayal of SCOTism. So actually read actual resources on SCOTUS. And this is also another point I want to make. I get questions all the time about comparing Thomism, SCOTism, and Palamism. And 99% of the time, the people asking those questions are not prepared to ask those questions or to understand the answer that they will be given. And so uh, as I was reading St. Augustine recently, and he talks about how we sort of ought to ignore people who are able to ask endless questions, but aren't able to understand the answers to any of them. And it's because we don't have the formations. I don't have the right formation for this, you know? The reason I'm doing this is because no one else is doing it. Um, and so I think we all need to be aware nowadays of our own lack of formation. None of us studied for 12 years in a seminary day in and day out year round in order to understand these sorts of work. We don't understand it like people used to. And so we just have to be aware of that. That doesn't mean we can't have original ideas. It doesn't mean we can't disagree. It doesn't mean we can't try to compare and synthesize, but we ought to be humble about where we actually are in our process of learning. And so I guess my advice, if people are asking me that question is, so you do the work, right? You read lots of books on Thomism, lots of books on Scotism, lots of books on Palamism, and you make the comparisons. Because I think that's going to be simply a lot better than trying to explain the difference when you don't understand the basics of either. Right? Why are you trying to argue, I'm going to figure out how Thomism and Palamism can be reconciled when you don't understand Thomism or Palamism? Or I'm going to reconcile Thomism and Scotism when you don't understand Thomism or Scotism. Understand the actual things that you're going to try and talk about before you try and do original stuff on them. All right. Here we go. This is a good question I like. Could a YAC accept aliens if they're descended from Adam and Eve, but genetically modified pre-flood and sent to space? Uh, there's a whole new species of rational animals. Yeah, I think that there's really no good reason for us to hold that that's the case, but there's really nothing contrary to scripture about that. And I've had thoughts about that too. It's sort of an interesting idea. I think that'd be a great basis for like a Christian science fiction book, but I don't know if we have any reasons that that would have happened. You know, there's lots and lots of discussion that goes on about aliens and are aliens compatible with Christianity? Are there aliens or not? Oh, we found some new evidence of aliens. Like in the Bible, we know interdimensional creatures exist called angels and demons. Like we have way cooler things than could possibly exist than aliens, immortal interdimensional immaterial beings. And you can already go read about them because we already have lots of works that are written about them. So go read those works and actually find out about the real, the real way more cool than alien creatures that actually exist. 
There you go. With chat GPT translation is so much easier. Yeah, I'd actually highly recommend uh, chat GPT as a Latin translation tool. Now you have to be careful because it frequently does make mistakes, but it is a lot better I've found than Google Translate. Um, people are asking about uh, Greek in the chat as well for it. I've never actually tried it with uh, Greek at all. I've only ever tried it with Latin. It's actually quite good at Latin. Thoughts on Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World Show. I've actually never listened to it, except the episodes on a young earth and a global flood. And that was just in my preparation for uh, my debate with Jimmy Aiken. So I really haven't listened to it widely enough to have any intelligent comments to make on it. Favorite European country. I don't know if I've, I haven't been to Europe really enough for have a favorite country, but I was just in uh, Rome recently and I very much enjoyed Rome. Uh, but I don't know if I could say I had a favorite European country. I've loved all the European countries I've been to. I've been to uh, England, Scotland, uh, France, and Italy. And I've been to the airport of Austria, but I don't think that that counts. Some defend current war crimes by saying if an enemy uses hospitals or civilians as shield, targeting an enemy is still double fact, so not a war crime intrinsically. Thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think that that's fundamentally right, that if you are targeting enemies and they put people in front of that, that that isn't, that you that by the principles of double effect, that is allowed. But, I think it's an important but, you ought to be very careful with not using that as an excuse to start killing civilians. And I heard a good analogy last night on this, where someone made the point that if someone grabbed your child, right, and it was trying to get away with it, and the police show up, you wouldn't ask the police to just open fire and not worry about killing your kid in the process. No, you would ask the police to do everything possible to kill that criminal without killing your child in the process. And so I think we ought to take reasonable precautions within war to still not kill civilians. But I do think there is a principle of double effect. There's also, though, you have to take that to a reasonable extent. So you can't just bomb a building and say, oh, I thought maybe there were... Um, weapons in it. And then we discover there weren't. But you actually have to have good reason to think that. There we go. Thoughts on celebrating scary or creepy aesthetics, such as in Halloween. Uh, is this celebrating the bad or disorderly imperfect, or is it okay? I really actually have no strong opinions on this, so I can't comment on it much. In your studies, what are the areas do you find SCOTUS most breaks with Aristotle? What about Bonaventure versus Aristotle? Do you think the differences are overblown? I think the primary differences that are going to come about are going to start from, and Bonaventure notes this very well, their differences on really the doctrine of creation and how they understand the relationship of God and this world. Um, and Bonaventure gives a very good overview of this in the Coelaciones and Examaron that because Aristotle thinks the world is eternal, that there's really no relationship then between God and this world, and there's nothing of, there's no exemplary causality within this world because God doesn't cause this world. And so really then you can't have Scotus's and Bonaventure's whole metaphysics of the transcendentals, of the will, of the self-revelation of God, of infinity as a positive cataphatic attribute of God. You can't have all of these things without the doctrine of creation. And you really can't have the doctrine of creation without God as personal. And so I think it's going to be God as personal agent and then the doctrine of creation that flows from that, that are going to bring about all the differences between Bonaventure and Scotus on one hand and Aristotle on the other. Uh, but, I mean, we're usually comparing, right, that Bonaventure and Scotus were most concerned somewhat with St. Thomas's use of Aristotle, but much more so the Averroist interpretation of Aristotle, sort of the pure Aristotelianism that they offered. And so they're still going to be far more Aristotelian than any modern authors are, but they're going to be a lot more willing than St. Thomas is to directly critique Aristotle. What is, I have some creepy dude in the comment. 
Let's ban you, that user and delete their comments. All right. Um, I got rid of that creepy dude from the chat. I don't see any more uh, comments here. Um, I want to give another book recommendation. It's not on SCOTUS. Let me see if it's here on my table now. Here we go. Yeah. This is not a SCOTUS book. Actually, this is a Thomas book. But um, here we go. Made by God, made for God by uh, Dr. Matthew Miner. Very, very good introduction to moral theology. Now, it is going to be a Thomist introduction to moral theology. Uh, so it's going to have some differences. And he actually notes at one point some differences. Uh, but very good book on moral theology. There's a lot of discussions on moral theology nowadays online are like random quotes from St. Alphonsus and debating whether or not those are correct. And a good point Minard makes is calling us back not just to quote mining uh, the manuals. Now he says the manuals do serve a purpose, but much more so we need to get back to the virtues in the actual principles of moral theology, the principles of teleology and so on. So not a SCOTUS book, but very good. Made by God, made for God by Dr. Matthew Minard. All right. Don't see any other questions here. Maybe we'll give it a few more seconds to see if any more questions come in here. All right, I don't see any more questions here. So uh, thank you everyone for watching and I hope that this was helpful for um, understanding Scotism. Oh. Here we go. Let's see.